Right. Good morning, everyone. Oh, welcome to a new session, a new day. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful morning, Lord, uh, even as we come together to study from your word and gain insights on visions and work cultures and values that we need to carry, oh God. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will, God, speak to each of our hearts, that you will minister to us in your own special way, oh God. I pray, Lord, that uh, these words and everything that we learn, Lord, will be a revelation in our hearts, that we will use it in our lives to glorify you and to build your kingdom here on earth. We thank you for this wonderful opportunity, Lord. We submit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, so before we go ahead, uh, just briefly what we did uh, yesterday, we looked at uh, of, uh, you know the points on how vision influences productivity. Uh, and one of the characteristics of a vision is that it is easily forgotten. So we need to write it, repeat it, repeat it again and again, right? Uh, then we looked at how when we have a vision, uh, we need to state it out loud and clear. And also with that, that vision, there's a mission behind it. Right? So to fulfill that vision, we need there's a mission. And we saw examples from uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and how when he came, he, he spoke from Isaiah uh, and he said, uh, you know, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've come uh, to bring the good news, to set the captives free. That was the vision. And how did he go about doing it? There was a mission, right? He chose 12 disciples. He went about healing and uh, bringing deliverance and setting people free. So as we set our vision loud and clear, we also need to, you know, let our team and the people know about the mission on how we're going about to achieve that vision, right? Uh, then we looked at values, uh, you know, values that are so important um, in an organization, uh, uh, even in our personal life. And some of the values that we, co-values that we looked at from our, uh, at, from, through ABC is integrity, excellence, uh, you know, people above policy, creativity, unity, and so forth. So uh, yesterday we stopped at uh, the part where we're going to be talking about how uh, the, a culture, that we need to create a culture aligned to our vision, mission, and values. And we picked up from uh, Nehemiah. Uh, we saw that how Nehemiah was, uh, Babylon has come. They have destroyed uh, Jerusalem. They've burned the gates down. And Nehemiah is working under this Persian king, right? Now, we also saw yesterday that he heard about the gates are burnt, the walls are broken. Now, there were many Jews there living in uh, that place during that time. But not everyone were burdened with it. So Nehemiah, God put a burden into Nehemiah, and it became a vision that ahead, like, I want to make sure that the gates are restored, the walls are rebuilt. Now, that was a good vision, but it was a big task. He, he cannot do that alone, right? It's, we're not talking about a small, you know, uh, a small wall that we're going to build. No, we're talking about, uh, you know, a la la large stretch of land. Uh, and so this task is not easy. So today we'll pick up from how did Nehemiah grasp this vision? How did he put forth that vision to his people? And how he went about with this mission, finally achieving the vision that God gave him. Right. So let's look at, uh, we're on page 45 on the notes. Um, and so we look at different aspects of how Nehemiah was able to fulfill the vision that God gave him. Okay. So Nehemiah shared the vision with the people of Jerusalem. Now, 
he went picture this he had this vision god told him you know uh, put it in his heart we need to build the wall we need to put the gates now he's calling forth his brothers and sisters that are jews and he's saying this is what god told me to do and he he was telling the people uh, that you know i've also got permission from the king the persian king and he has given us permission to go ahead and build the wall so he shared the vision to the people now the vision was compelling right everyone caught that vision people were inspired and they joined that vision now here is a very important characteristic when we have a god given vision and when we share it with people it will capture even their hearts why because god will put it in their hearts to join this vision right so sometimes we don't have to go running behind people you know i need workforce i need people to fulfill this task if it's a god given vision and it's burning in our heart god will bring the right people and god will speak to people's heart to join you in that vision nehemiah didn't say you know let's begin with uh, 10 days of fasting and prayer or uh, let's begin with you know worship for 10 days and then let's see what god is going to speak to me no he went he shared the vision with the people saying the walls are broken the gates are burnt we got to do something i spoke to the king the persian king has agreed and given me permission what do you think about it shall we go and build the wall it captured their heart and they said yes what happened before this they were not bothered about the wall and the gates they were probably busy with their own work but the moment the vision was stated loud and clear they caught the vision maybe they weren't interested before but now suddenly there's an interest why because god put that vision in their heart god ministers to people to help you and i fulfill the vision of god right so what it, what happened next now the people are, have agreed the jews have said okay i'm with you nehemiah let's build the walls let's get things ready now it's not a small task there's a mission the nehemiah had to plan out how the reconstruction uh, had to be done so here calls for wisdom right uh nehemiah was wise enough and he said okay so the wall is this long what we'll do is those living in different parts of the of the border of jerusalem you will look after building that side of your of the wall so that by the end of you know the entire construction you will know okay this is the portion you have built because this is where you live so it was a wise decision it was not like you know uh you have to wake up one morning pack your bags travel you know 100 miles then begin the construction no so nehemiah was very wise in this he said get up go to the closest place to the wall and build the wall right the nearest section will be yours so you will be personally involved in that work delegation right uh nehemiah delegated the work to people in the right way now here's the thing maybe most of them were not you know craftsmen or not people who were involved in construction maybe some were farmers maybe some were just you know doing small business maybe some were potters fishermen all kinds of people and they are going and fulfilling the mission ahead of them can you picture this none of them when we read the whole story of nehemiah none of them said i don't know how to do this none of them said that i don't know how to uh, i i'm a i'm a potter i don't know how to uh, build a wall no they didn't say that they said okay let's do it we'll find out probably they looked at others and they just learned it or they asked god for wisdom on how to go about doing these things right and so the wish the mission on how to go about building the wall nehemiah shared it with the people then 
comes the important part, values. What are certain values that Nehemiah carried and he initiated as they began to build the wall, right? First, everyone believed that God of heaven will prosper us, right? So here's the thing. They had the vision. The mission was ahead. Mission also was given. Nehemiah shared the mission, shared the vision. He said, okay, let's go ahead. But what are the values they carry? Probably Nehemiah said, listen, it's not by our own strength, but God, the God of heaven will prosper us. Because this vision is not a man-made vision. This vision that, I, that I'm carrying is not something that I felt on my own, but God has put it. So God, the God of heaven will prosper us. God is on our side. Right? This is very powerful. Right? Uh, when we have a vision and we know that it is from God and we know that God is on our side, nothing can stop us. Nothing. No, uh, uh, I, wanted to sh I want to share this. There's a pastor here, a uh, little away from our city, and it, he, he's he got, a, you know, it's very deep into the jungles. Uh, it's, a, it's like a forest area. There are no, you know, shops. There are no very few people. And, you know, it is, it is very isolated, right? Uh, there are no buses available. There's no transportation available. Uh, but as a young man, this this pastor uh, used to pray and say, God, use me for the ministry. And God told him, you start a church in the front of your house. Uh, of course, it was a it was a regional language. It is. Um, and so he began to ask God, how who will come to this place? This village probably has about a hundred people and there's nothing around here. Who, who will come here to church? Uh, but every day that vision began to burn brighter and brighter and brighter. And as a young man, I, I, I'm not sure what his age was, but uh, probably in his late uh, 20s or early 30s, he started the church. There were about 10 people who would come and sit. And people would mock him. People would make fun of him. Uh, who, what, what church are you starting here? Who's going to come? And uh, so for, for a year or so, it was very few people. But he had the vision burning in his heart. So he would keep telling the church, you know, one day we will be many people. You stay, you, you know, hold on. God will bless us. And here's what we will do. We will pray. We will, you know, we will uh, have these worship evenings or we will uh, pray for working of miracles. And, and over the years, the church started to grow. People started traveling from the city to this place, which is about an hour's drive deep into the village areas. They would drive from the city to there. And now the church has about uh, around 600 to 700 people. And, and they all, uh, most of them, you know, he's made buses so that, because there's no transportation. Even now that area is, uh, you know, it's just not been developed. So he's made buses. So people will get into the bus, travel all the way, one hour away. And he would have a service and, after the service, he will provide for lunch because after the service for them to get back home, it would take a long time. But now he's about 600 to 700 people. And I had the wonderful opportunity to hear how God, uh, you know, helped him in this vision that he had. So certain values, when we know that God is on our side, know that we will be successful. Everyone believed, secondly, everyone believed that they had to do their part. Yes, God is on our side. Doesn't mean that we don't do anything. But they said, okay, the mission is stated. Nehemiah said, I need to go here, build my side, my section of the wall. So everyone knew they had to do their part. 
And thirdly, they knew that while they're building the wall, there will be persecutions, there will be hindrances, there will be oppositions. Why? Because the Babylonians are continually, you know, uh, against the Jews. And you also got the Assyrians. Uh, you got the uh, you got these people coming and you know just trying to nullify or, or uh, you know just completely wash out the Jews. So they knew if we start building the wall, there's going to be opposition, right? Uh, but they were strong. They said nothing can stop us. Three important values: one, God was on our side. Two. We will all work. Three, nothing can stop us. No hindrance, no opposition, nothing should stop us also. So these are values they carried. So imagine, you know, I'll just give you a round off number. Imagine there were 300 people there. They woke up in the morning. He said, okay, it's time to go to my section and build a wall. They had these three things in their mind. One, God is on our side. Two, we all are working. It's not like I'm working and the other people on the other section are sleeping. No, we all are working together. Three, oppositions, difficulties will come, but nothing should stop us. Three powerful values. And we can carry these values as well uh, in our lives, in our organizations, in our ministries. Uh, and God is surely going to bless the work of our hands. Next thing we look at, very important. One was the vision, which he stated out clear. The mission, again, he stated out clear. The values, which all of them knew. Now comes the culture, right? Because we can have these three, vision, mission, values. But if the organization or the culture, the way people work, the community of living together was not in line with the values, then, you know, we don't feel like working. But what is the culture that Nehemiah raised under his leadership? One, people worked together in one strong community, right? So Nehemiah set the tone. Uh, what he did was he said, one, everyone will work. All trades of all ages, men, women, everyone will be involved in building the wall. And when we read, it's wonderful because the Levites, the, the, the scribes, they were also involved. Now, what does a scribe do? His job is only to sit and write the uh, you know text and translate and make copies. That's what scribes do. They were also involved in building the walls. Priests were involved in building the wall. Can you picture a priest? Probably the priest waking up in the morning saying, okay, he goes, to the, uh, he, goes he performs his prayers, everything. Next thing you know, he's there in the wall, you know, trying to figure out how things are done, but they all worked. It's not like the priest was sitting and saying, okay, you build a wall, I'm here, ready for the prayer. No. The goldsmiths, the, the, the people, uh, the merchants, uh, common people, everyone worked. And that's a tone which Nehemiah said. He himself also worked. And we look at it later. Right? What, not like Nehemiah was the leader there, so he's crossed his hands telling, okay, you do this, you do that. No, no, no. He put his hand to the plow. Right? Everyone worked. Two, they, when they worked, they worked with all their heart, with all their mind. Right? With everything that they have. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 6. Yes, could one of us please read that? Nehemiah 4 and verse 6. Yes, anyone? <clears throat> 
Nehemiah 4 verse 6. So we built a wall, and the entire wall was joined together up to the half its height, for the people had a mind to work. Amen. Thank you, Abhinas. So we see here that they all joined together, they built the wall, and it says that the people had the mind to work. Their heart was in it. You know, we may think, okay, well, what is the other work they did? How will they feed their family if they were going on working and building this wall? The, the other work was also done, but their heart was towards building the wall. When it came to building the wall, they were there with all their heart, with all their mind. There was no half-hearted work. There was no feeling of, do you think we can full, you know, build this wall? Do you think it's a possibility? Uh, there, was no, there was no questions there. They worked with all their heart, with all their mind. Three, they supported each other. Now, knowing that they were under some threat from the enemy, they supported each other. So if we read that, uh, it, it is wonderful. What happened was, God, Nehemiah, he says, okay, we know that the enemy may come the, the, uh, and they may come with their armies to stop us from building this wall and fixing the gates. So what we'll do is, example, out of 100 people, the numbers are, I'm just giving example on numbers, right? Out of 100 people, 50 people will work, right? You, you start building the wall, you start working on the wall, and the other 50 people will stand guard. So they will stand in front of them and make sure that there is, you know, even if the enemies come, they'll be able to fight them. So they supported each other. And then what happened was after some, some time, they would take turns. So the next 50 would work and the other 50 would stand guard. Nehemiah 4.16 writes that, so it was from that time on that half of my servants worked at the construction while the other half held spears and shields, the bows and wore armor, and the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. Right? So it, it, it's like a movie scene. You got, they're building the wall, 50 are waiting uh, uh, and ready in case of any enemies. The other 50 are working. They supported each other. Right. Fourth one, the rulers were urged to be generous. Now we must understand that when the Babylonians came, they they took the the Jews were taken uh, captive. They overpowered Jerusalem. Uh, there was still, you know, uh, prayers being offered. There was still leadership. The Sanhedrins, the Pharisees, the uh, the different kinds of priests. They were all still there, right? Now, Nehemiah was just a cupbearer, right? Uh, but he set an example of generosity by giving to those in need. So what does he say? He, he lets people, from what he has, he gave to others. He said, okay, uh, you know, you're, you all are spending time building the wall. Whatever I have, whatever I can give, I will give it. Right? Uh, if it was money, if it was clothes, if it was, uh, you know, uh, food or grains or anything, whatever I have in excess, I will give. So what did Nehemiah do? He set a tone. He set the example. So now the other rulers, maybe the free, the priests, the scribes, the rulers, uh, maybe they were the judges, the, probably some prophets as well. They were all there, and they may be watching Nehemiah. What is this man doing? Right, he's he has a vision. He's given us the mission, uh, and he's so full of passion. Let us watch him. And so, as they probably they saw him, and they say, "Hey, he's also giving the money, and all his belongings. He's willing to just give it away to the people." So he set the example, and he said, "Rulers, leaders, do the same, so that we will be able to." Bless the others as they are building the wall. Uh, let us be generous to one another. He also goes one step ahead. 
and he tells the people now if there are people who owe you land or they have some debts you know you borrowed money uh, and they there are some debts uh, which they have to repay back cancel that cancel it forget about it because right now all of that is not important all of this all our attention all our focus is on the wall rebuilding of the wall so if there are some people you have lent money to and you and they have to owe you back nehemiah is saying forget about it just let it go because they are building the wall honor them for that right cancel the debts give back you know whatever portion you have taken from people maybe their uh, you know uh, fields or their crops or their houses uh, give it back to them uh so that they can work with all their mind and heart uh and and you know uh, he's nema is setting the tone to be generous now picture this imagine you've got uh you know some rulers there and maybe somebody has uh you know taken uh, borrowed money and he hasn't returned it back so what they would do is during those days they would go and uh capture their house they would take their house or they would take uh, uh interest from them or whatever uh, fields and crops they have they would you know take most of the harvest from them and imagine if that was the scenario right uh it wouldn't be nice because here they want to work as a team uh, and here's the best part after nehemiah shared this nehemiah chapter 5 was uh 10 says we'll do as you say sorry uh, 5 was 12 we'll do as you say we'll give the property back and not try to collect the debts what an amazing testimony this is nehemiah himself did it first and then he told the leaders he told the others if there are people who you owe who money has to be owed to you or you have taken away their belongings because of this cancel their debts give back let us focus on the wall let us build the wall and what did he do he nehemiah didn't pressurize them he didn't say you have to do this he put it forth right he said he said we can do this i urge you to give it back to cancel their debts now it was their choice they responded immediately saying now we will not we will do as you say we'll give the property back and we will not try to collect the debts again this caused such a unity stronger unity imagine the people who had debts they are working and then one fine day the ruler comes and says you know you owe me uh 100 dinars now because we are building the wall together that debt is cancelled here's your house here's your you can go back to your homes you can uh, keep the land that you are uh, cultivating uh forget about the debt picture that man's uh, you know mindset after that he'll be so happy he'll say god thank you uh and he'll put all the more effort probably he was doing 10 times more than he can do now he'll do 20 times more because the debt is cancelled and there was a sense of unity at that time nehemiah led by example you know nehemiah was a cup bearer in the king's palace he was you know he had the option to go into the you know palace or whenever he wanted he could have the good food he he see he's a governor of, of of that place so he could have had good food he could have had the wine he could have relaxed uh you know he could have had everything that he would normally be uh, normally have as a governor but he acted differently he said no how can i enjoy all of this and then my people are struggling and building the wall i will also deny all of this and i will go and help in building the wall right and he avoided all the benefits uh as governor and he, and he went and he put all his effort all his energy in building the wall what a powerful example 
as a governor, he stood there, probably putting his hands into the bricks and the cement and building that wall. When he had the option of sitting in the palace, enjoying the meals, enjoying the food that he was entitled to as governor. Now, what would have happened if he was sitting there and doing all of that? Maybe the work would have gone on, right? The work would have, they would have continued rebuilding the wall. But when we set examples, it, it sets the tone to help us fulfill the vision, right? It, it makes us all feel as one. Right. Setting up, setting examples are very important. And now when we look at ministry, right, it is sad to say all across we see that leaders and, and, and pastors and ministries are setting wrong examples. Right. We should have a private jet. We should have a car, a, a sports car. We should have, I mean, this, all this is wonderful, but we should set good examples as well as leaders. The focus is not only on that. What example are we fixing in our setting, in our values, in our characters? Are we leading by example? These are things that we should see. Later on, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15 to 16, people saw great success because of all these values and culture that Nehemiah set in place. Let's read Nehemiah chapter 6, 15 and 16. Any one of us can please read. Mangi, uh, if you're there, can you read? Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, anyone else? Nehemiah chapter 6, 15 to 16? Yes, Pastor. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, and they were very disheartened in their own eyes, and they perceived that this work was done by our God. Amen. Thank you, Pratik. So, what a wonderful verse this is. After 52 days, the entire wall was built. Now, when the enemies, this is interesting, when the enemies of the surrounding nations heard this, they realized that they had lost the battle. And two, they realized that this wall was built because of their God's help. It's not something that can be done with natural abilities. It is God who helped them. The enemy realized that. The, the nations surrounding them realized that. Can you picture this? You know, the Bible is wonderful. When we read it, it's always good to picture in your mind, right? What, what is happening as you read, when you picture it, it brings about greater thoughts, greater uh, revelations, right? You got this small place in Jerusalem and there are different nations surrounding Jerusalem. Now, probably the news has gone out. Hey, there's this man named Nehemiah. He's a governor. He's called some people and they're building the rebuilding the wall. Probably they all looked and laughed at him. Then we go and stop this work in a few days. Let them start off. Probably they said, this is no, this wall cannot be rebuilt because these are not even, you know, oh. men who are qualified to do it. The people who are working. But the news is going out. And probably after a few days, maybe 20 days, they're saying, hey, the wall has come half the height. And it's 30 days. It's 40 days. The walls are reaching up. And then probably, you know, when we read the book of Nehemiah, there were oppositions. They came to, uh, you know, attack. But the Jews were uh, victorious. They were able to defeat the enemies. And then 50 days the walls already probably they're fixing the gates 52 days it is done here's what it says 
the surrounding nations, the enemies, knew that they had lost the battle. And why did they lose the battle? Because God was with them. They did it with God's help. And so these four, you know, when we read the book of Nehemiah, there's so much to learn with the way he modeled this whole vision that God had given him, right? It's good to think about the culture, talk about the culture. It's good to keep speaking about it, but it's more powerful when we model it and encourage others to model it, right? Which means when we set the example ourselves and encourage others to set the example, right? So for example, you know, and maybe in church or, uh, you know, prayer meetings, your meeting starts at 10 o'clock. Now, as a leader, if you are there at 9.50, you're setting the example, saying, okay, we'll start at 9.50. 9.50, 10 o'clock, it starts 9.50, we are here, everything's ready, the chairs are set, everything's ready. So when the people see that, you say, hey, he came at 9.50 and uh, he got everything ready. So you're setting the example. And then you keep doing that. What happens? people, you'll realize that people will begin to follow that. And then when you tell them, hey, our church starts at 10 o'clock, would it be okay if you can join us by 9.50? Now they've seen you doing it. They would also follow, setting the example, right? Uh, uh, culture is not just a concept. It is what we do. It is how we live. It is how we create an experience with our organization. Nehemiah did that. He, he, he didn't just, you know, it was not just a concept to him. It is, it is how, it is what he did. It is how he lived during that time. He was real, right? It was, it was not just some writings uh, or some fancy words that he spoke. It was real to him. And he was able to rebuild the wall. What are some of the cultures at APC that we have? Just want to share a couple of them. A culture of leadership and innovation. We want to raise up leaders. Uh, we want to raise up people who will be innovative in their, uh, in their ways, in their work. A culture where people connect, collaborate, and cooperate with each other. So one thing we, as we mentioned yesterday as well, that we at APC work as a team. When we lose, we lose together. When we win, we win together, right? Uh, when I say lose means when if certain things don't work, okay, uh, we take responsibility, all of us together, it's a team, right? A culture of being transparent and honest. Oh, this is something that we always, uh, you know, uh, like to carry as a culture in APC, be transparent, be honest. Uh, there are times as pastors and leaders, uh, we may be tired, we may fail, we may fall. Just be transparent, be honest. You know, we are not God. Uh, as, as people, even each one of us, we may all fail. Uh, so it's okay to be transparent. It's okay to be honest with yourself and uh, open to opinions, open to ideas, open to learning. Uh, so all of this is important. A culture of quality, equality, and respect, right? Um, whether we are on the pulpit or whether we are just, you know, in the sound and setup team, right? Uh, we all have equal honor. We all have respect for each other, right? And that's what we want to carry. Uh, we may be doing even the menial task of, you know, looking after the parking uh, of vehicles, but you honor them, you respect them because they're doing it out of their own free will. A culture of equality and respect, a culture of sharing and caring, right? Uh, work is more than a job that we do, but uh, we, we participate in each other's lives. Uh, we care for each other, we pray for each other, we share, we try to do as much as we can for our brothers and sisters. And that's the culture that um, 
a church that we want to continue to grow. Uh, and even as we do this, we want to have a culture of fun and laughter. So it's not like, you know, the church is like a place where, uh, you know, everything is strict. There is no, you know, enjoyment. There's no fun. There's no laughter. Everyone are, you know, in the holy of holies. No. We all can have a culture of fun and laughter, whether it's ministry or in the organization, in the workplace. Uh, we can have that culture, right? Uh, fun and laughter. Uh, work is fun. Find things to laugh about. Find things to uh, enjoy doing as a team. Uh, why do you, you know, a, a lot of companies have, uh, you know, uh, team outings or team uh, lunch, team dinners. Why? Because it's not only about work. It's about, you know, enjoying together as well. And so the, the culture we create determine the characteristic of our organization right uh, just a few more points and history is important capture it repeat it now in judges chapter 2 verse 7 to 11 uh, let me just read that so the people served the lord all the days of joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived joshua who had seen all the great works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died when he was 110 years old, and they buried him within the border of his, of his inheritance at Timnath, Harris, in the mountain of Ephraim, on the north, north side of Mount Gash. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation rose after them, who did not know the Lord, nor the work of the Lord, which, which he has done for Israel. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baals. You see how important history is? Moses came. He did all these wonderful miracles. Right? God, in his mighty hand, brought them out of Egypt. Moses went about, went, uh, died. He gave the leadership to Joshua. Joshua brought the people into the promised land. The walls came down and then Joshua died. And now that generation has gone. The people who have seen the parting of the seas, who have seen the miracles, that generation has gone. Now the new generation has come. They have no idea what are they doing in that place. They probably thought, okay, this is where we live. And what happened? They began to do evil in the sight of God. History must all is important. You capture history, you repeat it. We need to remind them. Probably the, the Israelites should have said, hey, you know what? Sit down. Let me tell you what happened. 40 years back or 50 years back, we were walking. We were in Egypt. We were in bondage. God in his mighty hand brought us out. We walked through the desert. We walked in the wilderness. There was... Uh, God provided manna and water. This is what happened. These are the miracles. They did not teach their children. The children didn't even know what was happening. The next generation didn't know. And so history needs to be captured. Yes, we don't live in the past, right? But we have to learn from their experiences, right? Now, all of us uh, have gone through, you know, uh, certain things in life and there are success stories there are failures right but we don't live in that but we learn from it because it would be foolish to you know look at the past and say okay i failed in this area uh, and to fall into the same pit again but we learn from history right every small step uh, is uh, you know every small success inspires us to do more uh, and if we are not progressing, we can we can stop and think, okay, what are the things that we need to change? So history is important, but also not to live in that, right? Think about it, learn from it, right? Take moments to tell relevant stories, right? Uh, some stories will be successful, some stories may be failures, and then you can laugh about it, hey. These other things. Let me share one thing that happened. There was this in 2000 and 
2016 January 15 15 or 16 I'm not sure but uh, you know there was an opportunity where you know it was given to me to lead worship for the first time in APC Central right so it was a bigger church with church with the recording and all of that and I was really nervous uh, I said oh god uh, you know recording and so many people and uh, and the first time I went to uh, you know such a big place to lead there's so many things that went wrong firstly I forgot the song list there were five songs I knew the first song and I, I completely blanked out on the second song the third song I didn't know what was the song and I didn't even know what chords were I, I, I was completely blank we finished the first song and I was looking at the other singers trying to ask them what is the next song then somehow we got through the next song and then the stage the mic started shaking and it started shaking so much that i had to keep moving here and there and as i kept moving the wire that's connected to the guitar started shaking and then the guitar stopped working everything went wrong that was the first time i led worship at uh, apc central and i thought to myself i'm never going to what an embarrassment i'm never going to lead worship in this place again it is so you know uh, it was it was bad but when i look back i think about it and i learned that hey i need to be more prepared for you know when when we are leading worship so i said okay let me write down the songs so I don't have to worry about, you know, even if I go blank, I know the song list. And two, let me make sure that everything is right. Uh, make sure the stand, the guitars, everything is set. So I realized that, okay, I, I have to learn from my mistake. Right? It's not like I have to say, no, I'll never do this again. But I learn from my mistake and say, okay. And now when I look back, uh, I laugh about it because I think of it, it was such, it's quite an embarrassing situation. But then, uh, God has helped me to, you know, grow. And and so when we tell stories, you know, there were people who are shy to come on stage and sing or lead the worship or, uh, you know, do anything on stage. So I share with them. I tell them, hey, even I was shy. These are the things that happened the first time, but we will learn. God gives us the strength. So we share stories not to bring people down, but in a positive manner. Right, you use use it to learn from it, and to spur action, uh, but never let your past stories hold you captive. Right? Let it not say because of this failure I will never do this again. No, let it not hold you captive. Let God use those. You use those opportunities. Those those. Uh, moments in history or the moments in the past that have maybe success or failure use it for your benefit use it to grow and to learn from it right uh, share celebrate people celebrate teams celebrate progress uh, right uh, i remember this uh, you know uh, success story that i'd like to share and i'll close with this you know, uh, we were working in the IT sector and, you know, many years ago, my early 20s, we were in this call center. We were a new team and uh, you know, there was a couple of us, two of us in our team who were very good at calls, right? So we could talk, right? we were very confident in speech. And then we were about a team of 15 people. We finished our training. We hit the floor, which means we started taking calls, live calls from different uh, countries. And during that time, there was a contest. The contest lasted for six months, right? And uh, we had a team leader and our team was a new team. So this team leader was given our team. All of us are new. We're probably just two weeks old into the uh, call center. And this contest was announced that every uh, every two weeks, there would be gifts given, right, for the best team. So there were about uh, eight teams on the floor. And I remember telling my team leader, we need to win this, right? Even my other friend said, we need to win this. And he said, well, how can we win this when, when, you know, all of us are new to the floor? And I said, okay, 
uh, me and uh, my friend and I, we said, can we meet with the team and we'll just share some things. And so we remember the whole team was, they're all, you know, 20 years old. They just finished college. They've come there. And I remember sharing, we, uh, as even the team leader, we shared, see, we told them, all you have to do is talk. Talk with confidence. Even when you don't know the answer, just talk with confidence. Don't give them wrong information, but talk with confidence. Be bold and be strong. And then we, you know, every now and then we would uh, encourage our team members. Now, each day, the highest a team uh, would reach was about 70 sales. That was like very good. That's very good, right? So the first week we hit about 50. And I remember saying, this is good. And we, our team leader was surprised. And then we said, next week we can win. So we kept telling the team, we need to win the gifts. You know, we need to win this team. And from the second month onwards, every week we won. We were hitting 80, 80 sales, 90 sales. And the managers were wondering, what, what is happening to this? They've just hit the floor. They, how are they doing this? And so they began to check. And all, 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 all that we did was we told, we were speaking with confidence. Right. Uh, and every for the next five months, we were the only team that was winning and we win uh, every contest. Now, after the contest stopped, we were not winning. But for the contest. So what am I trying to say? Uh, what I'm trying to say is when we, you know, celebrate people, when we celebrate teams, celebrate progress, uh, when you give them something to go for, they really work hard and God is able to, uh, you know, bless the work of our hands. So with this, we will uh, close. We finished on chapter uh, four. Next week, we'll pick up from chapter five. Uh, any questions? I know I've passed my time. Any questions, quick questions? If not, we can also pick up questions from next week as well. So any thoughts, any questions? Okay. All right. Shall we close in prayer? Uh, Samuel, uh, is it okay if you can close in prayer? Sure, Pastor. Um, but you'll have to excuse my background noise. I've got two kids. No problem. Go ahead. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this beautiful community and fellowship. We thank you as you teach us um, these principles that we can apply in our workplace, in our ministry, as we work with people, as we work for a vision and a mission. Uh, we thank you for uh, your servant, Pastor Paul. We uh, ask you to bless his ministry. We ask you to bless each and everyone who is in the class today. Uh, as you equip us and continue empowering us, um, Lord, uh, we wait for the day. And uh, we are already excited to be on this journey, uh, to be useful, to be vessels of honor and use for your house, Lord. Um, bless us throughout the day. Uh, help us learn, equip, and practice uh, everything that we can. This and everything we ask in the name of Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week ahead. I'll see you next week. God bless. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. God bless. God bless.